All right, I'll make a deal with you. You don't interfere with my drinking, and I'll stay sober enough to help you, says Hamish. But you have to do exactly what I say. It's not much of a deal, but still a giant step forward from ten minutes ago when we had no guide at all. Fine, says Peter. So help us, I say. When we get into the arena, what's the best strategy at the cornucopia for someone one thing at a time? In a few minutes, we'll be pulling into the station. You'll be put into the hands of your stylists. You're not going to like what they do to you, but no matter what it is, don't resist, says Hamish. But, I began, no buts, don't resist, says Hamish. He takes the bottle of spirits from the table and leaves the car. As the door swings shut behind him, the car goes dark. There are still a few lights inside, but outside, it's as if night has fallen again. I realize we must be in a tunnel that runs deep through the mountains into the capital. The mountains form a natural barrier between the capital and the eastern districts. It is almost impossible to enter from the east except through the tunnels. The, this geographical advantage was a major factor in the districts losing the war that led to my being a tribute today. Since the rebels had to scale the mountains, they were easy targets for the capital's air forces. Peter Malark and I stand in silence as the train speeds along. The tunnel goes on and on, and I think of the tons of rocks separating me from the sky, and my chest tightens. I hate being encased in stone this way. It reminds me of the mines and my father, trapped, unable to reach sunlight, buried forever in the darkness. The train finally begins to slow, and suddenly bright light floods the compartment. We can't help it. Both Peta and I run to the window to see what we've only seen on television. The capital. The ruling city of Panem. The cameras haven't lied about its grandeur. If anything, they have not quite captured the magnificence of the glistening buildings and a rainbow of hues that tower into the air, the shiny cars that roll down the wide paved streets, the oddly dressed people with the bizarre hair and painted faces who never miss a meal. All the colors seem artificial. The pink's too deep, the green's too bright, the yellow's painful to the eyes. Like the flat, round discs of hard candy we can never afford to buy at the tiny sweet shop in District 12. The people begin to point at us eagerly as they recognize a tribute train rolling into the city. I step away from the window, sickened by their excitement, and we can't wait to watch us die. But Peter holds his ground, actually waving and smiling at the gawking crowd. He only stops when the train pulls into the station, blocking us from their view. He sees me staring at him and shrugs. Who knows, he says. One of them may be rich. I've misjudged him. I think of his actions since the reaping began. The friendly squeeze of my hand. His father showing up with the cookies and promising to feed Prim. Did Peter put him up to that? His tears at the station. Volunteering to wash Hamish, but then challenging him this morning with apparently the nice guy approach had failed. And now the waving at the window already trying to win the crowd. All of the pieces are still fitting together, but I sense he has a plan for me. He hasn't accepted his death. He is already fighting hard to stay alive, which also means that kind Pina Melark, the boy who gave me bread, is fighting hard to kill me. Chapter 5 I grit my teeth as Vienna, a woman with aqua hair and gold tattoos above her eyebrows yanks a strip of fabric from my leg, tearing out the hair beneath it. Sorry, she pipes in her silly capital accent. You're just so hairy! Why do these people speak in such a high pitch? Why do their jaws barely open when they talk? Why do the ends of their sentences go up as if they're asking a question? Odd vowels, clipped words, and always a hiss on the letter S. No wonder it's impossible not to mimic them. Vienna makes what's supposed to be a sympathetic face. Good news, though. This is the last one. Ready? I get a grip on the, ta on the edges of the table I'm seated on and nod. The final swath of my leg hair is uprooted in a painful jerk. I've been in the remake center for more than three hours, and I still haven't met my stylist. Apparently, he has no interest in seeing me until Vienna and the other members of my prep team have addressed some obvious problems. This has included scrubbing down my body with a gritty foam that has removed not only dirt, but at least three layers of skin. 
turning my nails into uniform shapes, and primarily ridding my body of hair. My legs, arms, torso, underarms, and parts of my eyebrows have been stripped of the stuff, leaving me like a plucked bird ready for roasting. I don't like it. My skin feels sore and tingling and intensely vulnerable, but I have kept my side of the bargain with Hamish, and no objection has crossed my lips. You're doing very well, says some guy named Flavius. He gives his orange corkscrew locks a shake and applies a fresh coat of purple lipstick to his mouth. If there's one thing we can't stand, it's a whiner. Grease her down! Vienna and Octavia, a plump woman whose entire body has been dyed a pale shade of pea green, rub me down with a lotion that first stings, but then soothes my raw skin. Then they pull me from the table, removing the thin robe I've been allowed to wear off and on. I stand there, completely naked as the three encircle me, wielding tweezers to remove any last bits of hair. I know I should be embarrassed, but they're so unlike people that I'm no more self-conscious than if a trio of oddly colored birds were pecking around my feet. The three step back and admire their work. Excellent! You almost look like a human being now, says Flavius, and they all laugh. I force my lips up into a smile to show how grateful I am. Thank you, I say sweetly. We don't have much cause to look nice in District 12. This wins them over completely. Of course you don't, you poor darling, says Octavia, clasping her hands together in distress for me. But don't worry, says Vienna. By the time Cinna is through with you, you're going to be absolutely gorgeous. We promise. You know, now that we've rid all the hair and filth, you're not horrible at all, says Flavius encouragingly. Let's call Cinna. They dart out of the room. It's hard to hate my prep team. They're such total idiots. And yet, in an odd way, I know they're sincerely trying to help me. I look at the cold white walls and floor and resist the impulse to retrieve my robe. But this Cinna, my stylist, will surely make me remove it at once. Instead, my hands go to my hairdo, the one area of my body my prep team had been told to leave alone. My fingers stroke the silky braids my mother so gracefully arranged. My mother. I left her blue dress and shoes on the floor of, the tr of my train car, never thinking about retrieving them, of trying to hold on a piece to her, of home. Now I wish I had. The door opens and a young man who must be Cinna enters. I'm taken aback by how normal he looks. Most of the stylists they interview on television are so dyed, stencil stenciled, and surgically altered they're grotesque. But Cinna's close-cropped hair appears to be its a, a natural shade of brown. He's in a simple black shirt and pants. The only concession to self-altercation seems to be metallic gold eyeliner that has been applied with a light hand. It brings out the flecks of gold in his green eyes. And, despite my disgust with the capital and their hideous fashions, I can't help thinking how attractive it looks. Hello, Katniss. I'm Cinna. Your stylist, he says in a quiet voice, somewhat lacking in the capital's affectations. Hello, I venture cautiously. Just give me a moment, all right? he asks. He walks around my naked body, not touching me, but taking in every inch of it with his eyes. I resist the impulse to cross my arms over my chest. Who did your hair? My mother, I say. It's beautiful. Classic, really and an almost perfect balance with your profile. She has very clever fingers, he says. I had expected someone flamboyant, someone older trying desperately to look young, someone who viewed me as a piece of meat to be prepared for a platter. Cinna has met none of these expectations. You're new, aren't you? I don't think I've seen you before, I say. Most of the stylists are familiar, constants in the ever-changing pool of tributes, some have been around my whole life. Yes, this is my first year in the games, says Cinna. So they gave you District 12, I say. Newcomers generally end up with us, the least desirable district. I asked for District 12, he says, without further explanation. Why don't you put on your robe and we'll have a chat? Pulling on my robe, I follow him through a door into the sitting room. Two red couches face off over a low table. Three walls are blank. The fourth is entirely glass, providing a window to the city. 
I can see by the light that it must be around noon, although the sunny sky is turned overcast. Sun invites me to sit on one of the couches and takes his place across from me. He presses a button on the side of the table. The top splits, and from below rises the second table top that holds our lunch. Chicken and chunks of oranges cooked in a creamy sauce, laid on a bed of pearly white grain, tiny green peas and onions, roll shaped like flowers, and for dessert, a pudding the color of honey. I try to imagine assembling this meal myself back home. Chickens are too expensive, but I can make do with wild turkey. I need to shoot a second turkey to trade for an orange. Goat's milk would have to substitute for cream. We can grow peas in the garden. I'd have to get wild onions from the woods. I don't recognize the grain, but our own tesere ration cooks down to an unattractive brown mush. Fancy rolls would mean another trade with the baker, perhaps two or three squirrels. As for the pudding, I can't even guess what's in it. Days of hunting and gathering for this one meal, and even then it would be a poor substitution for the capital version. What it must be like, I wonder, to live in a world where food appears at the press of a button. How would I spend the hours I now commit to combing the woods for sustenance if it were so easy to come by? What do they do all day, these people in the capital, besides decorating their bodies and waiting around for a new shipment of tributes to roll in and die for their entertainment? I look up and find Sinna's eyes trained on mine. How despicable we must seem to you, he says. Has he seen this in my face, or somehow read my thoughts? He's right, though. The whole rotten lot of them is despicable. No matter, says Senna. So, Katniss, about your costume for the opening ceremonies. My partner, Portia, is the stylist for your fellow tribute, Peta. And our current thought is to dress you in complimentary costumes, says Senna. As you know, it's customary to reflect the flavor of their district. For the opening ceremonies, you're supposed to wear something that suggests your district's prin principal industry. District 11, Agriculture. District 4, Fishing. District this means that coming from District 12, Pete and I will be in some kind of coal miner's get-up. Since the baggy miner's jumpsuits are not particularly becoming, our tributes normally end up in skimpy outfits and hats with headlamps. One year, our tributes were stark naked with and covered in black powder to represent coal dust. It's always dreadful and does nothing to win favor with the crowd. I prepare myself for the worst. So I'll be in a coal miner outfit? I ask, hoping it won't be indecent. Not exactly. You see, Portion and I think that coal miner thing's very overdone. No one will remember you in that, and we both see it as our job to make District 12 tributes unforgettable, says Senna. I'll be naked for sure, I think. So, rather than focus on the coal mining itself, we're going to focus on the coal says Senna. Naked and covered in black dust, I think. And what do we do with coal? We burn it, says Senna. You're not afraid of fire, are you, Katniss? He sees my expression and grins. A few hours later, I am dressed in what will either be the most sensational or the deadliest costume in the opening ceremonies. I am in a simple black unitard that covers me from ankle to neck. Shiny leather boots lace up to my knees but it's the fluttering cape that ma made of streams of orange, yellow, and red, and the matching headpiece that defined my costume. Cinna plans to light them on fire just before our chariot rolls into the streets. It's not real flame, of course, just a little synthetic fire Portia and I came up with. You'll be perfectly safe, he says. But I'm not convinced I won't be perfectly barbecued by the time we reach the city center. My face is relatively clear of makeup. Just a bit of highlighting here and there. My hair has been brushed out and then braided down my back in my usual style. I want the audience to recognize you when you're in the arena, says Cinna dreamingly. Katniss, the girl who was on fire. It crosses my mind that Cinna's calm and normal demeanor masks a complete madman. Despite this morning's relevation about Peter's character, I'm actually relieved when he shows up, dressed in an identical costume. He should know about the fire, being a baker's son and all. His stylist Portia and her team accompany him, and everyone is absolutely giddy with excitement over what a splash will make, except Senna. He just seems a bit weary as he accepts congratulations.